right. Uh, we still have more folks uh, joining, but I think we should get started. It's an absolute pleasure to have everybody here. Thank you so much for joining the session. For this session, we are in webinar mode. So uh, just it's not as it's not as free flowing as we were in some of the Zoom uh, elements, but I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat as well for some questions that are coming in. But really to level set, uh, what are we covering today? Where are we going? And kind of what's the flow going to be for kind of the next 73 minutes is really we were talking about effectual innovation and bringing bolder innovation to large organizations. And uh, for the strategic doing practitioners, one of the things I want you to know is both effectual innovation and strategic doing really lean heavily into the, the notion of stone soup and the stone soup story. Uh, and I want to go quickly through uh, introductions, uh, just so you know who's here, who will be part of the conversation. Uh, me, I'm Matt Arnold. I'm a strategic doing practitioner. I'm co-founder of Spark Consulting Group. I, I focus basically on human-centered design, innovation, brand strategy. Uh, I also, it's a shameless plug, I also host a podcast that looks at creativity, craft, and innovation called the IO Idea Podcast. But uh, Ed Morrison, Patty O'Reilly, and uh, John Morley, so two of our panelists here, have all been guests on the podcast. We also have Barry McGee. He's the Director of Business Intelligence at Citrix. He's an experienced business leader focused on data-driven dri transformation and how it can create organizational value. So really excited to have Barry here. Uh, John Morley, who I mentioned, uh, convener, serial bootstrapper, and uh, so somebody that explores the intersections of complexity, innovation, intent, and agency. And uh, I, I want to say John is really the super connector that kind of brought some of these groups together. Uh, and John really helps forward-looking uh, leaders create new value uh, with existing teams and resources. And you'll, you'll hear that theme as we talk about effectual innovation. Uh, we have uh, Stephen McCarthy, lecturer and researcher in the Department of Business and Information Systems at University College Cork. His research centers on knowledge sharing in diverse IT uh, teams, participatory design and human-centered IT, and also the dark side of uh, technology. Really excited to have Stephen here. And Paddy O'Reilly, uh, Paddy does work with the Irish Management Institute, the Digital Transformation Lab. He's an adjunct professor at the University College Cork, and I just love the work uh, that Potty's doing on effectual innovation. And to get us going, Potty, if you don't mind, could you walk us through effectual innovation, kind of highlighting the principles and skills? And again, for our strategic doing uh, uh, practitioners, you're going to see a lot of complementary elements here to our strategic doing practice. And so we'll talk about what these are, and then we will also, John and Barry, uh, Stephen, Potty, and I will jump in, but mostly uh, John and Barry are going to walk through these after Potty's introduction, putting some meat on the bones and how this is applied in, in large organizations. So with that, Potty, take it um, away. Good man, Matt. Um, so you might just have to keep manners on me in terms of time, Matt. So uh, there's a danger once I start, I won't stop. Um, look, I, I suppose it, it's fantastic to be here. It's fantastic to be part of this strategic doing uh, practitioner conf conference. Uh, and I know what uh, I'm talking about, effectual innovation and strategic doing share, uh, I suppose, a similar pedigree in terms of a, a, an approach called effectuation. And maybe I'll refer to that shortly. But I suppose, what is the need for yet another approach to innovation? Uh, and maybe that's what I'll try and address first. Um, so innovation really for me is about how organizations can remain relevant in their environments. So the faster the environment is changing, the faster the organization needs to change in order to remain relevant. Okay, but also there's the concept of deep change. The deeper the change in the environment, the more radical the form of innovation required of organizations. Now, uh, I suppose when you look at organizations, there are organizations that say they innovate, but generally when you look inside the cover, a lot of them are talking about continuous innovation. Um, uh, maybe I'll refer to it for the moment, shallow innovation. So how do we do this deeper form of, of, of innovation? And that really is where effectual innovation comes into its core. It's about how do we innovate the way we innovate in these uh, organizations? Uh, it's not easy. Uh, especially in larger organizations. It's not easy to turn larger organizations around. Um, uh, it's not easy to implement radical innovation 
in these organizations. And that really is what effectual innovation is, is, is focused on. How can we do this within those organizations, within the covers of those organizations? Um, so it's really based on, on trying to create these, nurturing these spaces, these spaces where existing people, ordinary people can do what seem like ex extraordinary um, things. And that does happen in organizations. It can happen in organizations. And I suppose a bit of what we're talking about here, uh, it really leverages um, research that we've been doing that goes back maybe a number of decades. It, it also leverages experiences we've had in our own innovation practices. And that's maybe something we'll also be calling out um, today. So effectual innovation really is about creating these spaces where we can bring people into those spaces where they can do new things in new ways. And this creates what we call a multiplier effect, the multiplier effect you know, of, of uh, bolder innovation. But you need to find these spaces. And that's really what effectual innovation is, is focused on, is, is creating those, those spaces. So um, it's based on, a, I suppose, a systems uh, thinking type approach. What we've done is looked at the complexity uh, of innovation, lots of organizations. Um, the likes of Derek Cabrera, who talks a lot about systems thinking, says that even complex systems tend to have simple patterns behind them. Those patterns can be explained in terms of simple rules. And what we've tried to do is extract out those rules. And what we have here is those patterns in terms of principles and uh, skills that we can use then to leverage those patterns. So it's very much based on a systems thinking um, uh, approach to looking at uh, complex organizational in, in innovation. Um, it also, as Matt says, uh, has uh, similarities to effectual innovation. I know we and Ed Morrison have been in, in very rich conversations about the, the, the commonality across the two, the two approaches, which I think is something we, we, we will be exploring as, as we yeah. move on. And Patty, sorry to yeah. just jump into, but yeah, just reinforcing that connection too, just as you were talking about systems and for the strategic doing practitioners, we know that you know, Ed does talk a lot about uh, complex adaptive systems, right? And that they don't, they don't yield to previous best practices, right? There, there's really only promising practices is kind of the way we look at it in strategic doing. And so that I really appreciate what you've brought in on the, on the systems perspective to even just get started with, uh, with effectual innovation. Yeah, uh, spot on. And really what we're looking at, Matt, is, is um, really starting what we call these nearly local revolutions, uh, ordinary people doing new things locally uh, uh, creating change locally and then allowing it to contage uh, right back into the, the core of, 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 of the system. And we'll see that when, when I briefly go through these, these principles here. So there's, uh, I suppose, uh, a set of principles. There's nine of them listed here. And I'll just briefly go through each of them and, and point out maybe the skills that the guys will, uh, will, will talk about as they refer to their own experiences. So Principle uh, one, and, and these are very basic, you know, as we say, complex systems can be understood in terms of basic um, uh, rules, but that doesn't mean these rules are simple. Basic doesn't mean simple. So the first principle really is, um, I suppose, the, the, the big next really starts now. Um, uh, the big next being what's next around the corner uh, for this organization. Um, so I suppose when you go into organizations, there tends to be a gap between their intent towards uh, innovation and their ability to execute on innovation. Uh, and I suppose uh, the result of that gap very often is inertia. We're waiting for the perfect strategy, the perfect roadmap, the perfect um, plan before we really start uh, innovating in a more bold uh, way. Whereas what we're talking about here is actually the opposite. Don't wait for the permission of strategies, uh, roadmaps, plans, get going now. There's a saying, you know, there's no point digging the, the well when you become thirsty. You know, we need to dig the well before we become thirsty. The big issue uh, is, is if we start when I suppose things are very difficult, we start very late, the emotion of, of lateness, the fear of lateness can cause our thinking to close down, where we actually start to see less, we explore less. So the idea is get going now. This should be something that's ongoing 
all the time in our organization. And what we do is create pockets of this within the organization. Uh, the skill associated that is create the future now. Don't wait for the future. Let's design for the future now. Second principle is, okay, we start now. We need to start with new questions, big questions. Um, again, if you know, when we go into lots of organizations, you know, there's this idea of a default future. The default future is the future that our organizations nearly sleepwalk their way towards without even realizing it. We need to literally shock our systems, our, our companies out of those default futures by asking new questions. Those new questions tend to be deeply um, uh, exploratory uh, and really it's, it's about, uh, I suppose, creating new conversations because we know change follows conversation. So again, there's, there, that, there's probably, uh, that also probably mirrors uh, a similar concept in, in strategic doing. Um, so the second skill associated with that is seed wild ambition with big questions. We need to find the people that are going to ask these big questions that will literally shock us out of a default future, that sleepwalking. A third principle is after we start now and we come up with those big questions, then we need to start answering those questions from the edges of the organization. If you try and uh, answer these questions close to the core of the organization, there's a gravitational pull from the core that suggests things must be done in a certain way, you know, uh, using maybe certain people, uh, using existing means within the organization. And very often they impact the answers to the questions. So if we're asking big questions, we need to ensure those questions are going to be answered outside the gravitational pull of the dominant logic of the organization. OK, and this is the idea about identifying spaces for new growth at the edges. Now, these spaces can come from different places. Sometimes we call them you know, there's the cuckoo's nest idea that we, we bring this way of working into existing projects. OK, another way is we go off off the, the radar or we go off the grid where we start these uh, these initiatives where no one else really has, has a clear view view of them. OK, so there's different ways of starting these projects, but generally it has to happen at the edges of the organization, away from the dominant core. Uh, fourth principle is the uh, after we, I suppose, come up, uh, we start now, we come up with big questions, we start, I suppose, finding spaces for people to answer these questions. We bend, break and blend. In other words, we, we I suppose, really challenge this idea of the, the, the dominant logic. Uh, and in particular, we challenge the way decisions are currently made in the organization. The current decision-making schema in organizations puts a tax on all activities and particularly innovation. So if we have to keep on feeding information up for decisions to come down, and it's only then that we can innovate, then essentially we place a tax on everything we're doing. So what we're talking about here is we're moving away from the core of the organization to the edges, finding these spaces. Where we now need to come up with a new decision-making schema where the people that are performing the actions can make the decisions. And there's also this idea, you know, that we see in a lot of these projects where, you know, we, we, we don't ask uh, permission, we ask forgiveness. We, we, we tend to do these projects, look for the benefits, sell the benefits, or ask for forgiveness afterwards. So there's very much this idea of finding a new order, a new way of, of, of working. And definitely that decision-making and the collapsing of the decision-making is, is key. I think is that Margaret Wheatley, I, I, I listened to something from her recently said that, um, that uh, self-managed teams tend to be 35% more effective than, than all other types of teams. So really what we're looking at here is nearly these self-managed uh, initiatives. So the, the, ne the next one, principle five then, so after we've you know, asked those big questions, at, uh, found the spaces where they can be answered, breaking the existing rules, then it's all about starting uh, small. Um, 
And I think there's, there's a, a guy, John McKnight, talks a lot about how big change happens. Though he talks about change like, you know, the civil rights movements, the, um, the uh, I suppose, the, the, the female rights, the single sex rights, all those movements. Uh, he's, he talks about how they all start locally with ordinary people. They start as local revolutions. And essentially, the change happens street by street, block by block, building by building, person by building, uh, person by person. And that's essentially very similar here. You know, we, t we talk about really uh, small beginnings where uh, teams can start to come together, start to work together. And we know smaller teams are more effective than larger, uh, larger teams. And really, it's about then trying to scale from there. There's also this idea of, of the, you know, the, the, the power of the worm. Uh, so is it that a worm can dig something like is it six tons of soil in a single month? So what we're really doing is ordinary people have the means to create big, big change if we uh, empower them to make those changes. And we see that in some organization where people are allowed to change the organization, there can be major cultural um, uh, impacts as a result of that. Um, so that's uh, the principle five. Uh, the next one then is principle six, is that uh, the big next grows from existing uh, resources. Sometimes I suppose we, we, we think that we need these big budgets, big in initiatives, um, uh, 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 big sets of re resources. And sometimes they're associated what, with what we call you know, innovation uh, theater, these big in in initiatives. What we're talking about here is actually starting with what we already have. It's starting with the passion of the people for creating change, empowering them to uh, make change, and by combining resources, existing resources in new ways. Now, generally, we ask three questions here. You know, what can I do with what I already have? What can I do with others that I can collaborate with? And what can't I do other than working with others? So generally, we're trying to tease out uh, the resources we have available, combine them in new ways, because we know Literally, innovation comes from combinations of existing resources, but new combinations. So that's a principle six. Um, principle seven, then, is the big next grows quietly and, sl and slowly. So again, like I, I, I said about you know, John McKnight and this idea of, of big change happening locally, is big change really very often happens quietly. So we, at the start, we don't, I suppose, start uh, making these big uh, announcements. And we were talking about Dave Snowden earlier. You know, Dave talks a lot about you know, the, this idea of making big strategies about the future is a waste of time. Because if anything, it's just going to build up the antibodies in the organization towards that change. What you're better off doing is creating change locally and letting it to nearly contage from that local to where it becomes and it's seen by people as a viable alternative to the dominant logic in, in the organization. And this is, this, uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry just, and I uh, just also just uh, making a strong connection here too with, uh, right, with strategic doing, you know, one of our rules is uncovering hidden assets that people are willing to share. And I, and I know you've talked about that before, but uh, not to take you off, off path too much, but I think one of the important things is, uh, the notion of trust and trust building, but what are the assets I'm actually willing to share that I, I believe in this enough, here's what I can give you, right? It's not, it's not a shakedown for lunch money, right? It's, it's making sure there's an environment where people can trust that. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that from some of our earlier conversations too, about people feeling that they can trust that they can share these assets. Yeah, and that's it exactly, Matt, because what we're trying to do is through building quite slow, quite momentum is we're building tr trust locally where people can work, learn to work with one another, are starting to achieve uh, local impacts. And then we're building that momentum towards bigger impacts. There's a great study, actually, Matt, that talks about, uh, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I just can't remember the authors, but it talks about the rolling out of, of um, 
solar power, uh, solar uh, panels to communities. And they talk about that, that one way of doing it is by uh, signing up as many of these big experts, thought leaders in, in locations. Um, or the alternative is literally going a building by building, street by street, and trying to change. And what they found is more effective is the idea of trying to build a critical mass of people locally that imp uh, implement a change and then it'll contagion from there out. Whereas if we try and maybe get very dispersed people to make the change, then there isn't that critical mass to build trust in, in the location for that initiative. And this ties in with this idea also the law of Raspberry Jan that we've spoken about before. You know, um, sometimes the more you spread something, the thinner it gets. And the less, uh, I suppose, of, of a social argument there is for the change. Whereas we're probably not better, we're, well, the, the research shows we're probably not better off spreading too thin. We're actually better off doing things quite uh, deeply, locally, and letting it contage from there out. Um, so I think that is a very good point. Trust, you know, there's this idea that you know, change moves at the speed of trust. You know, if we don't build trust, then we'll never build that momentum towards bigger change. So principle eight then is, is essentially, you know, then leveraging that local trust, um, I suppose, to build a contagious uh, effect, you know, where uh, uh, others are starting to uh, implement the same change, but we're trying to show them, we're trying to guide them as to how to do it. So we're bringing our initiative to others, we're supporting others now to implement a similar initiative in their own backyards. And that's that contagious uh, effect that we speak about. And the final one then, Matt, and I'm just conscious of, of time, is the principle nine, you know, look, there's, there's the big next can be many things, you know, but I think we're now in a position where organizations have no choice but to do the right thing. Okay, it's become a mandate on them from customers, it's become a mandate on them from employees to do the right thing, not just do things right, but to do the right thing. And that's that, that it isn't just being human centered, doing things that are right for maybe customers, employees, but it's been humanity centered. What's the best for this planet? And that's definitely a trend we're seeing where these changes now are trying to drive, not just be good, but do, do good as well. So Matt, I think, Hopefully, I know it's a, a very quick um, overview, but hopefully that covers um, um, the, um, the, the principles and that maybe opens up the door then towards the skills that the lads are going to, to uh, go through. So yeah, yeah, over to you, Matt. Potty, thank you so much. That was great. And just right before I turn it over to John and Barry, just showing folks again the, the skills associated with effectual innovation and uh, don't don't hesitate to put some some questions comments uh, in the chat. I'll be monitoring those as we go. But uh, I I just love how how complimentary this is and the conversations that you and Ed have had too about effectual innovation. One other thing that I'll share for folks that have been able to uh, talk with uh, Sebastian at uh, Human Insight and or look at uh, growth curves and S curves. We'll see a lot of similarity there too, where it's just for me, Potty, sometimes these organizations that may have been uh, innovative in the past, but they've almost calcified around. So I really like your notion too around the edges to avoid that gravitational pull and the different styles of leadership we need to keep uh, you know, growing, growing individuals rather than falling you know, in line with the hierarchy. So to uh, ground this in a little bit more reality, we're going to talk about the hows related to these skills. And, and for the first skill, I know uh, John Morley is going to take that one. But as we said, creating the future now is, is that first skill we want to talk about. Thanks, Matt. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I'm John Morley, and I'm currently located in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. I'll give you a little geographical pin to put on me. Um, and thanks to, uh, to everybody here for sort of helping me get my head around and learn about effectual innovation. I think um, I'll land this with a little bit of context, but also to everybody here, um, I love any co-comments or, or anything that's in the, in the chat as well that we can refer to as we go through. Um, just, just to start off with, in sort of skill one, creating the future now, the context for me in approaching this was that I was in a sales support role. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about here briefly. 
And uh, what you used to get as you headed towards the end of each quarter was this massive hockey stick. And of course, it was it was a hockey stick that affected the whole organization. So one of the things I was very curious about was how might we actually flatten out that hockey stick? And instead of sort of flattening it at the end, it's actually lift up the, their level throughout the entire quarter so that we um, we we actually delivered more uh, without all of the panic. Um, and so the role that I had at the time involved working every day directly with customers and directly with sales teams. So um, I'll, I'll walk through a little bit of the images, but in terms of the question of how did we get going, I think the first thing really is, is to mindset. Um, and uh, looking back on it, realizing that it was really an abundance mindset. It was a sense that with all the talent, with all the resources, with all the people that we have here, I'm pretty sure that we can create amazing things um, without actually having to add more headcount or more cost. Um, now, in, in subsequent years, what I've tended to do is gone back and I've become a strategic doing practitioner. So later on, you'll see, I'll talk a little bit about how we use some of the strategic doing rules in, in supporting these. But my first thought for how we get going is to think abundantly. Don't start off with what it is that you want to have at the end consider what it is that we would all like to be. What is our aspiration? Um, and when aspirations are big, it's always nice to start small with, well, what are the possibilities? Um, and that sense of moving away from the, the, the end of the hockey stick, and that's what I was trying to show with the little battery diagram, is, is always be innovating, but particularly be innovating when there's no pressure on you. Um, and so those of you who've done some design thinking will recognize the image on the top left. It's an empathy map. So when you engage people, what, what can you garner about what they're thinking, hearing, feeling, saying, not saying? What are their current goals? What can you pick up about pains and gains? Um, and question that and use your intuition about that. And the little graphic about people is you can't rely on yourself because complexity is all about, as we know, sort of not being able to see the whole system from a single point of view. So gather in those radical collaborators. Um, Paddy referenced about systems thinking, and I think that's really important, is that always be thinking in systems. If this affects me here, who else does it affect somewhere else along the chain? And who is it for? Why are we doing this? What value? What is, what, what is it that they would like to be? So, so my sense of creating the future now is all about having some clarity about who it is we would like to be together not so much on what it is we want to have or do because those things will emerge and it's all about being ready for those to emerge. Um, so I might, I might hand it back to you, Matt, at that point, and we'll get into some more detail as we go along. Yeah, I, I love it. Thanks. And I, for uh, skill, skill two, I, I believe, Potty, you're going to take that one? Yeah, so it's, it's myself and Steve here. So we, we had the pleasure really of working on um, a very interesting but very complex project, um, uh, Steve, I think it'd be fair to call. So we had IBM as a partner. Uh, we also had uh, an, a national health insurer as a partner on this project. We also had um, uh, a startup in the in the, the sort of the health screening space, as well as a, a university and a hospital. And it was focused on really a connected health uh, solution whereby we could um, monitor blood pressure of pregnant women in their own home so that we could detect the likes of preeclampsia or hypertension, et cetera. Now, it was really interesting um, at the start, I suppose all those partners came into this space, I'm going to call it a space again, with their own ideas of what the, the, the question was and really trying to answer that question from their own perspectives, what's best for their own organization. And this was going to uh, cause major issues because we had a very tight project to deliver in a certain period of time. And of course, you can't ask pregnant women to maybe deliver a baby in four and a half months or nine months because our, our deadline is, is, is in trouble. So uh, what we, we had to do was really bring people together to try and figure out, well, what are the big questions that we can all agree that we, we that really would be passionate about answering and I think those big questions ended up being about what is the best we can do for the pregnant women you know some that suffer preeclampsia as opposed to what's best for our own organizations and I, I, I Steve, I'm sure Steve has something to add to that as well because it was really about that reframing I think Steve you know trying to reframe the questions we we're asking about the future. Mm, yeah, that's exactly it, Paddy. Um, I think when it came to the big questions we asked, one of the key ones was who and why. So who were we doing this project for? And it, it was pregnant women. So I think what was interesting actually for clinicians, we assumed that 
their perspective would be entirely patient focused. But I think one of the challenges was the firefighting that's necessary in the hospital, trying to pull them away to see a broader perspective and particularly see the patient's perspective. Um, I think some tools as well that we developed as part of the project were crucial in that. Things like journey mapping, storytelling, um, pulling people again away from day to day to see the broader system, I guess, at play. Um, and it was challenging, I think, even bringing people into the room to show them that they, not everyone was on the same page was a very important step, creating that space. And then take him on that journey, particularly see it from the view of the motors who would be using the app and how it could change the system. I think um, it was a challenge, but I think through using these participatory design techniques, it really opened people up and you could see people adopting them and actually adopting the persona as well of a pregnant woman. Uh, so even male developers who have no experience of pregnancy starting to see it from the perspective of a pregnant woman. So. Yeah, bring people out of that firefighting mode to see it in, in a more organic uh, perspective of what we were going to do was, it was a really crucial step in the project and really set us off on the right step going forward. Yeah, and I think that's a very good point, Steve, because I think this project would have been completely different if we did not reframe that question. We'd have ended up delivering a project uh, according to the best practices of project management to hold mm -hmm. that. Whereas essentially that reframing changed completely that project. What is the best we can do here for these uh, women? Uh, and really that question drove completely new conversations. Uh, we needed new uh, answers to those questions. That drove what we call the 10X thinking, uh, questions beyond the norm, you know, um, uh, answers beyond the norm. And where we weren't focused on issues among the different partners, the deficits, the problems, we started looking at the opportunity, what was over the next hill. So back over to you, Matt, again. Yeah, Potty and Stephen, thanks so much. And just, just trying to do some connecting the dots on that too for folks is, is you could hear a lot of kind of rule one and rule two for me uh, from a strategic doing, right? That we're maintaining a safe space for deep focus conversations and that you were framing the conversation around an appreciative question, right? That, and, and ways that you can bring people together on that. So uh, in the, also in the spirit of time, wanna to move to, to Barry. Uh, Barry, I know you're gonna talk about uh, three and four. So uh, take it away. Yeah, thanks, um, uh, Matt and hi folks. Um, I'm coming to you also from Ireland. I'm in, I'm in Dublin in Ireland uh, on the uh, East Coast. Um, so a little bit of context for uh, where my experience comes in. I, I'm currently with Citrix. I spent 15 years at IBM before that. And after, you know, I've been 20, 25 years in sales, marketing and strategy, I got very interested in how data and analytics could engender organizational change. And in a very on the ground uh, way because I carried the target um, and I had the team. So it wasn't a, an abstract thing. So what I'm talking about here is, you know, the last 10 years of experience really in, in saying, well, what happens when you try and do these things? So on this skill three, this, this whole area of creating space for growth of the edge, there's a couple of things that jump out. And um, <laughs> the first one is probably the bureaucratic thing and, and avoid the, 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 the bureaucracy. And how we did it simply was, you know, I, I was running a team at the time, big sort of renewals business with like a quarter of a billion turnover, but we found this little sort of way of, of hacking a, a, a information together to find customers more effectively. And we had enough success there that we tried it out. I was asked to try it out for other business units, but the boss, my boss at the time who ran all of, you know, digital sales for EMEA Europe, he said, don't tell anyone. We're not telling global. We're not telling worldwide. Okay, let's keep it on the covers. I'll let you, and that created a role for me then. I came out of a commercial role, and I went into this like uh, role where I ran data strategy for the business, and we just hack and we try stuff. But under no circumstances, even if we had great success, would we go, which was a typical cultural reaction, is to sing your, sing your successes from the rooftops and say, aren't we awesome? Okay. No, because as soon as you start raising the, 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 
the awareness. People will try and jump on it. They will try and strangle it. They will try and control it. They will squeeze the life out of it. Um, so we intentionally didn't. And again, that for me was a sort of, that's how we created this space. Um, it was an interesting question from, from Doug in the chat on this one is, my boss is a very good example of exactly a leader who knows that they can't do the solutioning. How do you find that energy to do it? And looking back, I think probably he found me or I went to him because I was a catalyst. Like the, way that, the way that I would answer a question is a leader like that needs to create a way of being to find the change agents. The leader says, look, I don't know how to do this. I know it needs to be done. Who are those little, you know, the, 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 the advocate generals who are going to go out there and push the buttons and ask the difficult questions? Now, my boss had a very interesting way of working with people and he was very close to them. And he knew that others would follow rules and I wouldn't. So therefore, right, you're the guy to go and do the Trojan horse strategy. So that's, that's on, on, on skill three. If you want to go forward, then Matt, I can touch on four as well. And this is the thing about you know breaking and, and transforming it and this whole broad thing of, 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 of challenging the existing way of doing things. And just by way of example, I think Paulie made a point about challenging the way decisions are made in the organization. Now, interesting, what we found out when we went about, okay, how do we figure out a better way of driving client engagement. Who should we talk to next? The interesting thing was when I started researching and going into it, everyone had a different opinion. The second line manager said we should do this and this. So uh, I think we should do this. This is what we're this is what this is what we're actually doing and this is what corporate is telling me to do. And then you went down a level and you discovered there was something else going on. The manager underneath him was paying lip service to his boss, doing his own thing anyway, and actually his report to doing something different. So in actual fact, you have this sort of very chaotic um, uh, manifestation of what the strategy is meant to be. Back to Pawdy's point about system thinking, this is literally a manifestation of competing mental models for what should be happening and what is actually happening. So you've got this, you know, you call it the busy fool paradox. Everyone's busy being busy. And in particular in sales and marketing, there's a premium put on execution. So the appearance of being busy and doing stuff is just as important as the actual delivery against the number. Um, so what we did was we started looking at this and says, it's not just about creating a new process. Of course we did. We, we, we got our, um, we started to say, well, let's, how can we build a mechanism that helps us make better decisions? But critically, we said, what do we stop doing? We have to stop the chaos. And what we call it is the reign of lists. Now, there was actually another phrase for it, it's a little bit more rude, but it was that crazy. Everybody, particularly in larger matrix organizations, they've no shortage of data and they've no shortage of people telling them what to do because they've got multiple stakeholders. And that's what you're solving for. You're not solving for a data. You're, not, you're solving for how do I decide what to do today? And I've got Paulie tells you you need to do this. You know, John says that, Steve says that, you know, uh, Matt says that, and Bob in, in, in networking says something else. How do you solve for that? So while we did focus on innovating around creating a new mechanism, it never stuck until we got people off the addiction to, oh, I'll just do my spreadsheet, I'll just do what he told me. I just So you have to balance them out. And you need to be a fairly thick-skinned individual to go in there and challenge that status quo. I'll keep coming back to that point that Paddy has raised earlier on in his rules about you can't be a person who is a rule follower in order to engender this type of change. So, um, that, I'll leave that one on, uh, on, on scale four for the moment. Barry, thanks it. so much. Just a couple things too, is I absolutely love that, that cartoon uh, and, and, and that almost the currency of busy versus a currency of results uh, that is exchanged yeah. in organizations. And uh, one, of the, one of the things I just threw in the chat for folks is uh, a couple months ago in Nature, there was an article just about how we struggle to subtract. Humans just, we, we tend to, when we see a problem, we tend to keep adding on rather than subtracting. So just uh, supporting your argument there. I loved, loved your uh, coverage of those skills. John, we're gonna go back to you for skill five. Perfect. 
Thanks, Matt. And a lovely segue, Barry, because I can relate to a lot of what you said there. Um, in terms of this uh, sort of how do we invite ordinary people in into small teams and taking small steps, there were three things that came to mind as I listened uh, to, to Barry and Potty and Stephen. And, and um, those were is reinforcing that the whole is greater than the sum of the individual parts. And, and really, I feel that strongly. Um, secondly, the sense that uh, start small, think big and move fast. Um, and you don't have to peanut butter and go across everything. But when you find something, just blow it out and, and, and give a couple of examples of this. Uh, look to emulate and, and repeat in different sort of uh, spaces or domains. Um, and the other thing then that, that brings us sort of firmly into strategic doing territory is um, I would say stop talking about problems and, uh, and really focus on aspirations or possibilities. Um, the example I wanted to talk to about here wasn't one that was generated with strategic doing, but the team of people I built it with, we actually do use strategic doing uh, now for, for many of these things. So um, the question that we're looking to address is how do we find the right people to work in the right way? Well, the context here and the reason for showing you the big sort of technology block here in the left was this is a, um, a product that in the mid sort of 2010s got up to about a $2.5 billion per year run rate in revenue. Um, and it really came about between about 10 people asking questions of each other and of everybody they, they, they met along the way. And, uh, and to, to Barry's earlier point about sort of not going global, um, I ran a small uh, sales enablement program and uh, we were given pretty tight goals and uh, from a company that was headquartered on the East Coast of the United States and I was based on the West Coast and the, the one piece of advice I got was don't go native. Um, and what that meant was don't talk to the people around you, always listen to what we're sending down the pipe to you. Now the reality was, and this is where I wanted to go to the next bullet, was that the constraints they put on me versus what they had actually given me to do the job did this. So I had no choice but to go native. So in terms of saying earlier, sort of go, lead with who you want to be before you to figure out what you got to do, I decided we're going native. Um, and uh, and uh, another example of that that I'd love to give is that I've had a lot of times in my career where somebody's come to me and from above and sort of said, here's what we want you to do. Here's when we want you to do it by, and here's how we'd like you to do it. Well, now, if you, if you give me those three, I, I now have no agency whatsoever. So you're going to get the result that you've prescribed. So part of this is concept of constraints versus tolerances. I am, I'll do two of those three, but I can't do all three. So how, how much flexibility have I got in the system? And who looks like they've got the energy to show up with me? And Barry referenced Catalyst. I'm telling you, these people, you know, you, you know what this is. These people surface, they emerge. Um, and when they emerge, you grab them and you have conversations like, what's this? What could this be? It's, it's the link and leverage assets piece that we get in strategic doing. It's like, how big could it be? I mean, that's cool. And where can we start? Do we have a coalition? Meaning, like, have we got shared purpose? Is there something here around which we, we, we know that we all have this common bond and we would really love this to be something that we can point to and, and, and be, um, be... And John, can I just come in and just connect on that piece? Because I think it goes back to Doug's question, is that it might be, it might seem an obvious thing that those catalysts, they'll pop up, you'll know who they are. But lots of cultures will repress them and yeah. push them down and say, oh, no, 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 you don't know you and your smart ideas or, or whatever. It, you will see them, but a lot of cultures don't reward them for diverting from this is what we're doing, that's what's on the plan, that's what's on the PowerPoint. So I think we need to almost create that process or systems or at least thinking this is, oh, there's one, there's one, and water it, you know, it being a person, <laughs> encourage them and get them to feel emboldened to go bring their ideas up because that is not the norm. And I've done my stuff for like probably 20 different companies and 20 different environments now. It is not the norm. I can guarantee you so, that. Sorry, John. The, and John and, and Barry, th this is great. And I know we're, we're, we're kind of constrained by time a little bit, but one of the things I find really interesting here is also from strategic doing and from design where, you know, it's this, it's trying to understand the problem where when, and when John was describing this too, and, and Barry, I was hearing in yours too, it seems like everybody's mental model already has a solution baked in. And then it, it's like so much energy is spent on why aren't we implementing the solution rather than uh, do we do we have a clear understanding of the problem? So that's one of the things I throw in 
to the mix too, from my perspective. Well, I know we got Q and A at the end. I'd suggest maybe Matt come back to that. Yeah, um, I'll probably partially agree with that, but come back to the Q and A and let's just for it. But it's a good point. By the yeah. time Q and A, you'll fully agree, Barry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Uh, so let's uh, and 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 John, thanks again, Barry. Why don't we move to skill six? Yeah. So six is yes. This is basically start with what you have. And again, I just noticed uh, uh, Chuck um, had a question on this one. And the reason I've got Bill Gates on this is because, and this is having coming from a big tech background, still in a, you know, a fairly big tech background, is the whole field of data and analytics is full of big tech companies saying, spend big, buy a bunch of PhD students. It's technology, it's technology. And I'll tell you right now, that is BS. Complete and utter, okay? And I'd argue that this is not probably real truth, but I'd argue the reason that Gates is probably still one of the richest guys is Microsoft Excel. Well, the big tech is out there saying, buy a Watson, buy a cognitive of this, buy a, buy a, you know, some massive, you know, supervisor controller computer, whatever. It's a big hammer, you know, it's using a hammer to open an egg. Okay, that whole sort of uh, uh, approach. And the reason I say it is everybody in the industry I've worked with in this field of analytics, everyone thinks someone else has a big, really cool analytics solution. And the truth is, everybody is one of most of the decisions off spreadsheets. Okay, so when I started my journey in, in this field was back in IBM, you don't get, I mean, everyone thinks from the outside IBM has tons of, don't get any resources at all. You literally got to sign off white, three forms to get a bottle of white out, okay? So I had nothing. And it was the best thing that ever happened to us because we started with what we had. We had, let's just take some Excel. Do you know a bit of code? Okay, let's try this. And there was data sets literally sitting down the back of sofas. They were just sitting there and no one was using them. Let's repurpose it. Bring that data set. What other data would be interesting? That data. All these things existed, but no one was really leveraging them. So this is this, uh, there's an interesting point that Paulie raises here about the power of, of recombinant. I'm not even saying that right. Um, I'm actually, I'm coining the phrase recombinant innovation. Is you can make really cool stuff with stuff that's already there. Hmm. Okay, and but Bar people were just looking at these things. Yeah. And I'd say all future stuff is a combination of stuff that already exists. You know, because there is no other way. We can only yeah. make do with what yeah. we, we yeah. have, but we combine new ways. But I, I love your story because it also reminds me there was um, a real legendary IT director in IBM back in the 90s, Jim Canavino, I think was, was his name. But uh, at the time, I don't know if you remember, Louis uh, Gerstner had come in and IBM were literally on the floor. In the 80s, they were the poster child. By the 90s, they were in danger of missing the, the internet uh, boom that was the come later except there was a programmer um, I think David Gr Grossman was was his name that was really trying to point out so this guy was a renegade he in fact he was the IBM renegade that was talking about guys there's a future here you need to see it you need to see it but Jim Canavano turned around to him and said I don't want you to have um, a, a new unit I don't want you to lead a new unit I don't want you to have a big uh, budget because you will then have to abide by the rules of IBM I want you to go um, uh, from the grassroots. I want you to change from the grassroots. Yeah. And he yeah. was he was spot yeah. on. That's yeah. how IBM essentially hopped in front of all those companies, compacts, you know, the decks that were, had overtaken them uh, by, uh, I suppose, uh, embracing the, the internet and the evolution of the internet. Again, it was, a, it was a, a renegade that had done that, going native. John talks about going native. The only way of some of this change is by going native. Well, I mean, just to finish off this slide, then, I mean, you would have think you would have thought that in IBM, when we're trying to do how do we improve client management? Oh, sure, we can just get Watson. That was a question of us getting Watson. We wouldn't got it close. So they saved that for the customers. So we start with Excel. It was like literally me, an Excel sheet, and a couple of borrowed arms and legs. That iterated and pivoted and over time became a multi-hundred million dollar turnover application that got funding because it was successful. And the beauty of it was, is we got leaner and fitter and we had no um, technical or innovation debt because we had gone through it the hard way. So we hit the ground 
it didn't have that fat in it that big applications did. And that then is what, so in the end, it then became a, co a proper cognitive tool as opposed to starting at the top and moving down. But um, let, I'll, I'll keep going on that one, Matt, because we can go on that one yeah, for hours. Thank you. And okay, yeah, <laughs> this is me too. So the, the, okay, so on this one, the build slow, uh, and you know, build slow momentum. I think there's a lot of coverage of this type of phenomenon in general, but I'm going to I'm going to postulate a reason why. Okay, certainly from my experience, in 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 data and analytics again, because it's oversold as a panacea that will solve every problem known to humanity. Okay, it creates an absolutely massive set of expectations, and it's almost you know predestined to fail. What happens in, in data analytics in particular uh, is that it, there's a story that a guy called Bernard Marr uses as an analogy of sort of shaped a little bit, is most businesses are like, if you can imagine, a, a cobbler, okay, a shoe shop. But fact is, it's in a small little room and there's four guys, okay, and they're lit by candlelight. One guy putting on the upper, one guy putting on the sole, someone else doing the laces and someone else counting the money. Okay, bring in organizational change, in this case, data and analytical led organizational change. It's like walking into the room and flicking on the lights. And suddenly the business realizes <gasps> half the, the, the uppers are at right angles to the soles, the laces are all done skew ways, half the money is out of the, 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 the cash register, and it's a bit chaotic. They are nowhere near as lean and efficient as they thought they were or had convinced themselves they were. Now, what happens there is two things. First off, the organization realizes, because you flooded it with transparency, that, oh my God, we're, we're not what we thought we were or not what we were telling everyone else we were. First thing, obvious enough. Second thing, however, is they find out at the same time as everyone else. So they have no time or space to adjust. And they go into shock and it just pushes out against the change initiative. And that that's where the whole culture eats strategy thing. The data and analytics imperative itself could do the job perfectly well, but you've literally called them out. The whole emperor has no new, has new clothes thing. So this is why I say the madness of King George is often the organization you're trying to help does really realize it has a problem or the nature of its problems. You tend to get asked to solve symptomatically instead of causally. You go in and do what you're asked to do, or what the right thing should be to put its last bullet. The, the patient mightn't want to hear the, the, you know, the diagnosis or the prescription, and you have to tread with that one carefully. So instead of going in and flooding the organization with light and say, oh, there's, we do this, we do that, that, a lot of people have a lot of vested interest in what you're calling out here. So instead of going in and flooding the place with light, the analogy I we use and the approach we take is go in and say, oh, hi folks, I'm just gonna dim the light up here slowly. I'm gonna step out for a few minutes and then I'll come back. And it allows the organization to come to terms with the change. You're not calling them out. They get to sort of maybe re reposition their own narrative and then say to each other, okay, we've got this problem, this data and analytics thing, because if it looks like you're the one coming in and preaching all the things, you're disempowering, you're disenfranchising all the, the leadership team, and no one likes to look bad, even though they're all profiting from it. So uh, the reason I call this the sort of the madness of King George and the madman doesn't know he's mad is everyone's busy being busy. No one gets time, in particular in sales and marketing, to reflect on why it's not working because of the premium put on just execute, execute, execute. So when you go in and you do this sort of stuff, you're making folks look less than uh, uh, optimal in their performance. So you need to go slow so the organization, the culture comes with you. Otherwise, it'll eat you up. Um, that's that one on, on seven. So I think my hand off to back to John now, right? Skill eight is still you, Barry. And then John, John's going to bring us home. John's going to bring us home on nine. Yeah. <laughs> So this one, this one actually is, is sort of also related. The whole thing about scaling through contagion. And actually, it is very much related. And this is, if you get into sort of the whole field of behavioral economics and, and, and that whole thing, is that in, in large organizations, 
people do not necessarily do what is what you think is the right thing or the obvious or the logical thing okay they behave by a whole other set of levers okay for example in my experience this analytics capability was able to make people a fortune but i get managers coming up to me reps executives saying shh i don't want to make 102 percent of my target I'll have to work too much. I don't have the resources for it. And by the way, if I get if I overachieve my target now in Q1, they'll just give me a bigger target next quarter. Shh, be quiet. People don't behave as rationally as you expect. So you have to find what that sort of little uh, those mechanisms are. Um, and also, if it's a central mechanism you're switching on, in our case, going and preaching about how it's going to do something, it, it's never going to work because you'll always be seen as working to the man's agenda, corporate's agenda, or the CEO, or whoever, okay? So instead, what, what worked has worked massively effectively for us um, over 10 years is find the folks, like your end users who are, oh, I'm really interested in this, your early adopters. Get them, get them board board, white glove them, treat them like absolute kings and saviors and queens, and they go, oh my God, this is great, this is so cool, so cool. And when their results start going through the roof, everyone else will say, oh shit, how, 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 did, how did he break his target? How did he get to his target? How, how did, oh, that's not fair. Now that same person, if you had given them the chance to try to say, oh no, this will never work and they'll come, no, nah, no, nah, I've been around, I know how, I know my customers, I don't need your analytics, that's just a buzz, blah, 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 this is academic. But the same person, if they see someone else outperforming them, will behave completely differently. They want to know, I want it, I want it. And their buy-in then completely shifts. You then get competition between your end users to get access to the technology to outcompete the other people. Because they, they don't want you giving someone else a competitive advantage. And that was just a sort of a simple enough little hack is find your early innovators, your early adopters, make them tremendously successful. And then they will do your transformation for you. It doesn't have to be you as a technologist. It's that we're the end users, don't ask me. Ask him how he used the technology and how he innovated with it. And that, that, that's been a, a key for, for driving for us. Now hey, I'm handing over to John. Yeah, yes, thank, you, thank you so much. In, in the spirit of strategic doing nudging, uh, thanks for keeping us moving. John, skill nine. Yeah, I think this is all about just being a good human. Um, there's a, something that a, a sort of loop back to where we started off, which was think abundantly. Um, there's something somebody said to me, uh, our, our friend, Fran, who, who couldn't be with us this morning, unfortunately, but um, Fran told me something last year, which really shaped my thinking about this, which she said to me, method follows intent. And that made me stop for a moment because we live in such a do and have world that actually for somebody to say, don't worry about those, what's your intent? So I, I definitely come with, you know, how do we ensure we're doing the right thing? Start with our intent, think abundantly, um, lean towards the aspirations. It's all there in strategic doing right at the front. And I think that's probably why it's such a game changer, uh, strategic doing. Um, I think what this allows us to do, and this is a little bit earlier on, is we're always going to operate in spaces where there are constraints, but we've massive tolerances in this. Um, and there's lots of models. If you're into design innovation, you've probably come across Doblin's 10, 10 types of innovations. There's lots of different techniques for how we can find that elbow room to actually create great things. But it starts with that abundant thinking and bringing people into the camp um, and thinking in regenerative ways. Um, something that struck me on Monday, I, I loved the talk by John Hagel. He talked about moving beyond fear. Um, some of us will be familiar with the work of Alan Moore, where he talks about the possibility of regenerative business. And in fact, that regenerative business and business sort of goals as normal, are, they're not doing this. It's actually that we're, we're, we're not thinking the same way in both, and there's no reason we can't. So uh, for me, in, in one sense, a lot of this conversation is how we go from some of the conditions John Hagel described to some of the conditions that Alan Moore describes. And this is a journey that I think effectual innovation really enables us to do very, very well. So it's it's how do we look at these alternative frames? How do we validate them? Um, just to pop back to the previous story for a moment, um, we, our, our team that pulled together that, that product, we led with B and we created a product and, and our management team sort of flew out from the East Coast to effectively fire us. But because we actually showed them that we could get them a result with a, with a set of methods that they hadn't sort of considered possible, 
um, they immediately saw that there was an alternative frame and embraced it. And I think that's a little bit of what Barry was referring to as well, through all these examples is you got to you got to push it out. You, you have to sort of lean on your intuition. You have to find the people, but ultimately you have to be a good human. And, and, and for that, I would also say one of the key sort of I'll, I'll sort of wrap up here with maybe two key things I've learned in the last couple of years is one is there has to be value for everybody that's involved. And again, what I loved about strategic doing is I think that's is that rule number five or six match is, you know, can everybody derive a metric from this before we move forward? That is absolutely essential. Um, and, and in understanding that and putting that in place, we John, may change yeah, the, John, the do or the have. So, uh, yeah, sorry. It's just, uh, I just want to make sure that it is, that is rule six. Rule six. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Matt. Um, and because that, that allows everybody, we, we may have to change the thing that we thought we were going to have, but what it really does is it reinforces that we are together in, in terms of what our aspirations and intent are. So, so the last thought I wanted to leave you with as, as from my perspective is that I spent a lot of my career talking about what I was striving to do and God that, you know, all the amount of people I had to convince and all this and that and the other. Um, today, what I really, really lean into is um, where do I feel most in flow? With whom do I feel most in flow? Where's the energy coming from? Uh, I'll tell you what, it's not coming from the goal I have to achieve. It typically is coming from, oh gosh, I'd love to live in a world where that is the prevalent sort of condition. So I'd, I'd love to wrap with that and hand it back to you, Matt. And, um, and thank you. It's been... <laughs> John, John been yeah, thank you. So uh, just kind of to remind folks of, of where we've been, and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump into conversation that you know, we tried to keep, uh, uh, keep in touch with the chat there. Some, some great questions and comments. But right, the creating the future now, breaking and transforming to create new order, right? Kind of the almost the tyranny of, of busy there, building slow, you know, with quiet momentum. And as Barry said, the madman doesn't know he's mad. Uh, seeding that wild ambition with big questions, uh, creating spaces for new growth, uh, ordinary people, small teams, small steps, uh, create combinations of existing resources. And in a bootstrapping nature, even at IBM, home of Watson, uh, it was really Excel that was doing the, the heavy lift early on. And uh, scaling uh, change by lighting the path. How, how can we show others? And I really appreciated uh, some of Barry's kind of behavioral science, behavioral economics approach too, to not doing it too fast, but then also uh, people wanting to be successful, seeing how others were successful. And again, the, the humanity-centered nature that we talked about. And John, thank you for such a wonderful close on skill nine about be good and do good and how we, we really believe that a rising tide can lift all boats. And, and Potty, if you could, I, yes. I, I think what fits here too is, is how you said, it's like, it, it's still the, we're, we're dreaming big, right? It, it's big ambitions. How do we start small? And, and that humanity centered to me is, is a big, important ambition. Yeah. And like, I, I suppose I, I'm looking at maybe the, the, the questions there as well. Uh, Matt and um, I'm intrigued by maybe the fact we're, we're trying to create um, I suppose um, a bridge between effectual innovation and strategic doing but I'm also intrigued by the differences between them and I know that's been come up in previous conversations with Ed Morrison in, in, in particular um, and I think maybe so, some of those is organizations commercial organizations tend to have very strong gravitational fields pulls you know and I think a key element here is far more radical bolder innovation you have to try and move away from that pull that gravitational pull and find these spaces new spaces you know um, and those spaces do do exist and there's people already in those spaces uh, and trying to find those people so back to a question I think Kevin was asking there you know about you know the the the, the this idea I think um, if, if I uh, get it correctly the, the immune system the way we try and get away from the immune system them is by moving away from that gravitational field we can do it let's say like the cuckoo's nest where uh, we do it under the cover of an existing project but we just do the project in a new way like the example steve and i gave of that connected health we already had a mandate to, to do it but actually we start asking new questions that's an example of of um, where we had the cover of the cuckoo's nest and the existing nest another way of, of doing it is going off the grid 
did and maybe um, what happened in uh, NASA, the NASA Renegades is an example of that, where people were doing it in their own spare time to come up with a new architecture for the control systems for the space shuttles, trying to upgrade those that had been there for the Apollo. They did it in their own time. And then when they felt there was something to show, like Barry says, they sh shone the light into the organization, started demoing. Another way of doing it is, is, is uh, I suppose, where you got the cover of a leader. And let's say the example of, of um, Jim uh, uh, Canavino in IBM is an example of that. He said, look, you've got my cover, but let's keep this off the radar. So I think that we have to find those spaces. Once you find those spaces, then Kevin, is you're less likely to get that immune response until you have something that you can demonstrate. And then you let it literally contage in. To know back into the organization. And can I just come back into that point again? I was going to reiterate, Paulies. I think, Kevin, your question is absolutely uh, uh, spot on. And again, to reiterate, my experience is there's two approaches. If you are lucky enough to have an, an executive sponsor, exactly as Paulie says, and exactly my lived experience is, and they say, okay, Barry, what do you want me to do? I say, give me a little bit of space, give me three months, keep everyone off my back. OK, and then you go get your, you know, get your wins and then say, look, this is what we found. And also, by the way, your anti-logs, the, the, the bits that didn't work are just as important. If you're not lucky enough to have an executive sponsor and you're in your almost your prototyping stage where you have an idea before you go to your exec to get the, the sponsorship, follow the same methodology. Don't even tell anybody. So I have an idea. I wonder if we did this and this and find, in my case, find a really innovative change agent style sales rep or a marketing uh, uh, manager who loves trying new stuff and is interested and wants to sort of shake it up a little bit. I say, okay, I'm gonna try something here. If this works, it'll make your life easier. And then, and I say, let's not say it to anybody, go do it. Just a little sort of a, you know, side by side project. And then, if that works the way you think it works, if your hypothesis proves to be correct, whatever you're doing, then you've got, oh, shit. And then you've got the executive going, oh, how come France? In my case, it was, well, how come France is after blowing its marketing number in this bit? Uh, well, we we're going to tell you before now, but that's because me and Pascal, we did this for the last three months. We tried something different. <gasps> tell me more. And then you start, you start, and ironically, you actually start the, the latter way. Start one to one, and then that gives you the contagion. So that's like the VP or the upline manager. Says, well, what did you do here? And then you do it with them, and you tell them not to tell anybody, and then you make the VP a hero, and then the VP tells the SVP, and you just work it like yeah. that. And I, but you can start I, I, so easily. I'm sorry, but and I really love that example, and it probably reflects examples that we've seen as well in our experience. And the other thing is, be very wary of the expert. You know, the experts come yeah, in yeah, and, and there's yeah. a saying, the expert doesn't have to sit in the cockpit as you're flying towards that mountain. Uh, what you need is people that are on the ground that are experiencing what needs to be, uh, I suppose, engaged with customers, engage with fellow employees. There's a great um, study and Margaret Heffernan talks about it, though. I think she calls it the star chickens, you know, where there's a, a, a scientific study where they divided chickens into two groups. One was the best laying chickens and the other were just the ordinary and actually when they came back afterwards they found that essentially the best laying chickens had nearly eaten each other alive because they were competing with one another you know whereas the ordinary the ordinary chickens had actually outperformed them um, and I think that that idea is, is really important that uh, there's a, a certain knowledge that experts have that tend to be based on previous experiences ordinary people on the ground are experiencing the reality of today and the way things are going. And they're the people we need to engage with. Yes, experts are important, but we need to get ordinary people involved in these in these projects. Potty, yeah, I want to jump in on that too and just making a connection too to some of the strategic doing practitioner training where uh, we've sorted through the difference between complex adaptive systems and uh, basically more simple uh, or even complicated problems. But as you said, and, and Barry was highlighting too, the, the role of the leader in complex adaptive problems is providing air cover, is helping. You know, the other hierarchies do make sense for simple problems, right? Because now it's, there is a best practice, there is efficiency, but I think we- Yeah, we, it's control, yeah. 
we I think we we also mix mix up what we understand to be either simple um, or complex. But yeah, with those complex and with innovation, where we really do need uh, coaching, even coaching upwards on our leaders. And Barry, I heard that you know it's like I you know what I need I need air cover. I I need some of these things. And I think Kevin, to to your question, you know, in the question, I, I've seen that is my experience in consulting is many leaders don't know how to be an executive sponsor, but it, sometimes that name is just given to them, but they don't know really what you need. And in, in safe ways, how can you share that with them? Here's, here's what I need, uh, right? And, and it's kind of understanding their goals. But I, I just did want to highlight that, that difference too between the, the complex that you're dealing with in an adaptive system for innovation is if the, the leader isn't there to tell you, and, and like, I think the way John enumerated, I need this done by this date. That, do, that doesn't work for complex problems. Yeah, and, and I can see just a, a, an answer from Kevin here as well, you know, about um, executive sponsorship is great when, when you have it. Now, sometimes executive sponsorship comes with a mandate that you're going to do it in a certain way and follow the dominant logic. Now, if that's the right. case, then you're not going to end up with bold innovation. In fact, there's, a, there's a research that shows that good teams and good organizations do not come up with good ideas because good teams are, are I suppose, have uh, developed a way of working where they tend to apply certain processes in a certain way uh, and come up with certain results. So very often, I, uh, I think we need to break away from that. Sometimes good teams aren't what we need. We need new people thinking in new ways, maybe forming these loose uh, groups. So yeah, I agree with Kevin. I think when you can get executive sponsorship, the example of Jim Canavano there, who's going to provide their cover, it's fantastic. But also we need to be careful where the executive sponsorship means we have to do it in a, in a, in a certain way. That's a great it, point. It works when you're ready for it. The worst thing you can get is an executive sponsor when you're not ready. If you go in with a half-baked idea, no evidence, no, no, no pilot, no prototype, nothing to stand over your hypothesis, then an executive sponsor is a, a concrete <laughs> uh, belt around you like and you're jumping into a river you're, you'll just drown because the executive sponsor will want updates but they'll they'll spin it don't lose for a second they'll you know they'll do that whole thing so only seek executive sponsorship when you've developed the hypothesis and tested it and you know it works again again corporate firms doesn't always work that way having a bright idea is good enough you know, the appearance of, 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 of busyness is just as important as, as the actual efficacy of the idea. And that's a dangerous trap. So the, the thing about executive sponsorship is we'll be very, very mindful of. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to be mindful of time. We're just about at the, the top of the hour, which is officially the end of our time. I know that uh, the conference schedule, there's a long break. Uh, so my potty, my understanding is for us, we're, we're willing to stay on for a little bit more if there are any other questions. So I just wanted to see from the chat if there are any other questions or comments that might come up, but also want to be respectful of attendees uh, yeah. time. Yeah, that, uh, and I'm definitely, I'm happy to stay on. I'm sure whichever panelists can yeah. stay on, feel free to stay on, guys, or anyone that needs to go. Yeah. Um, and also another point, because I'm always, um, and I know it's a question that comes up every so often, is that this is fine in certain types of organizations, you know, but it, it, it doesn't work in other types. Now, remember, the case studies that we've been following, you know, from maybe a research point of view, are, are in organizations like NASA, IBM, Microsoft, Hire, you know. So these are big mainstream organizations. This is a model that has worked in terms of creating uh, deep change, bold change in those organizations. Um, so so I, I just want to say that we've also come across, obviously, the, the fact that there's uh, four of us, um, five of us here, uh, we've come across it in our own experiences as, as well. It's about providing space to ordinary people. It's as simple as that. OK, uh, at the moment, we've uh, is it less than 30 percent of employees in large technology companies don't feel uh, don't, are, are, don't engage. They don't feel fully engaged with the organization. That's a massive uh, overhead. 
It's about actually uh, giving those people a purpose by giving them a space where they can actually change some of the things about that organization. Okay, so over- uh, I Just yeah. one point, another question coming up there, sorry. I was gonna say, uh, also when you talk about case studies and the likes of IBM or, 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 or even such, it's, it always starts with one team. You tend to think, oh God, IBM can do it. But the truth is, anything I've certainly done, I guess the same for the other guys, it's just, you start with one team of 10 people or five people and it grows from there. Maybe at the end of it, it's something bigger, but as always a start, you don't never start something, let's do something for a business unit of a thousand people. Never, ever, ever. I would, it would never work anyway. I wouldn't have the patience for it. <laughs> but there is a small teams uh, and just start from there. Barry, one of the things you said that I, I want to highlight for folks too is the, the notion of uh, sometimes people hear IBM and they, they think IBM budget, right? That it must be big, right? And, uh, and you said like how, how hard it is to get budget. And my, my personal experience, I've been in companies where I had zero budget right, on things. And I also uh, I did uh, a lot of work for John Deere on their kind of next gen display systems and information systems. And then when I was talking to somebody else about my work, they're like, well, I don't have John Deere budget. <laughs> well, John, my John experience Deere is John Deere having, budget. Budget, <laughs> having budget breeds lazy ideas, lazy thinking, simple solutions to complex problems. It's probably the worst thing. It's what everyone wants. But, and I'm in a different, I'm in different roles. I'm in roles where they have plenty of budget. You know, when you have, you know what happens when you have budget? You think your job is to draw it down. So, because if you don't draw down your budget and just spend it, you won't get it next time around. So I'm very grateful for the fact I didn't have budget because it forced yeah. me to innovate, to, to pivot, to iterate. I was, it's like, it's like training in high altitude, training for a, a marathon in a race in high altitude versus training, you know, when it's you know, in a much easier environment or swimming upstream versus swimming downstream. If you can run at high altitude, you can run downstream. So you're already pre preventing the, the types of things that will, will, will attack an innovation once you go wild if you don't have budget because you've had to do it the hard way and therefore you're going to be much more fit for purpose it's the whole steve blank agile manifesto thing you know a good idea doesn't survive its first encounter with a customer <laughs> right but all over that uh potty one of the things i want to jump in if you don't mind uh, a little bit because one of the things that hit me is you know is we're, we're talking about uh, growth from the edges and some of that was to avoid the gravitational pull or um uh, kind of the, the tax of the organization, right? Uh, that bureaucratic tax. One of the other things that I think about growth at the edges is uh, from a biomimicry standpoint, when we see the edges of two different ecosystems, uh, those edges tend to have a lot more uh, diversity as well on the way they've adapted rather than things that are almost like a monoculture if it's plants deep inside. But I, I don't know if that provokes anything. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's, it's so... I, Obviously, most of us, when we think organizations, we think of you know uh, hierarchies and organizational structures. Now, we 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 know uh, that the number of people at the base of that hierarchy is way bigger than the number of people at at the top because of the nature of the Christmas tree uh, size. So. Uh, when we look at organizations, uh, Matt, we have a lot of people that are naturally closer to the edge of our organization. They're closer to customers. There's, in fact, a zero distance to customer in some case. They're de working with customers on a day-to-day -day basis. They also have zero distance to one another. So what we're talking about is, is, is exactly as you say, there's a diversity of views a diversity of perspective naturally at edges that's different to those at the top of, of the of the hierarchy. And of course we know from the likes of um, you know um, the um, the law of requisite variety it's called when you're dealing with complexity you have to ha tackle it with diversity. That diversity is at the edges of our organization. So I think we need to go and find it. We need to leverage it. Uh, I don't know how many times I've been involved in innovation initiatives and let's say halfway through or even at the very end, you hold a retrospective and next thing someone says, sure, we always knew that was never gonna work. 
and you say, well, why didn't you um, make this known? Because no one ever asked us. Our opinion was never of importance. And, and I think, is it is it Gary Hamill, I think, has uh, re research that shows, you know, is it something like 5 to 10% of employees um, feel that their opinion is important in their organizations? There's about 10% feel they can take risks when making decisions. They're tiny numbers, you know. Thank you. Any other other thoughts before we we close for for the yeah. afternoon or for the evening? Yeah, and and I think maybe a point earlier, Matt, and I'd love to even know hear your views on it because you are a strategic um, doing practitioner. But I, uh, maybe a point I was going to make: there are differences between effectual innovation and strategic doing, even though both of them share this effectuation uh, sort of pedigree. Like for me, uh, uh, I suppose effectual innovation is is about conversations, but it's about quite conversations, conversations at the edge. It doesn't look for these big conversations at the very start it looks to keep things under a cover the safety of a cover to know uh, that you don't i suppose cause those um those antibodies to know to, to 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 fire and that you start to scale up from those discussions but i'd be very interested in what your views are to know about the, the differences yeah uh Patty, i think for me um the I guess it's it's hard for me to see big differences more than like some similarities and how they're they're complementary. But um, I think one of the things where the the smaller conversation, the starting small, on the edge to me feels like um, uh, Matt and, and I, I apologize for struggling, but it it feels like uh, a coalition of the willing. What's the the safest space we can be in to have these conversations? And to me, again, it's the framing the conversation around an appreciative question to find who might be interested in this. And I can only compare that to like early in my career working in large organizations from a change management perspective, we used to like basically try to make a rational argument for change. This is why we need to do this. Hope everybody's on board, right? But uh, <laughs> those were crushed very quickly, right? And then realizing for me, what I call coalition of the willing, who might be interested in doing this who do we have trust with? What are the small experiments we can run to go in that direction? And using that uh, appreciative in inquiry frame uh, to bring even diverse groups together. So there, there's an outcome that we want to see, the positive outcome that we want. Sometimes when we talk about how we're going to get there, we already start butting heads. So I don't know if that's helpful. That's, but it's one of the things where I see a lot of similarity there. Um, I think Two is some of the practice, though, in the uh, and I'd be interested for any other attendees that are on to to comment. But um, you know, strategic doing talks about a thirty thirty, right? And that's a time frame is and it's referenced thirty days. It doesn't have to be thirty days. Um, just I think one of the things I've seen in organizations is just the it feels like the time scale is faster than when we're we're working like with with nonprofit organizations, but. We still have to work slow to build momentum. So those those are a couple thoughts, uh, not quite differences. Um, I apologize. Yeah, no, I think I think that's very interesting, Matt. And and uh, like I, I think um, and I see a, a comment here as well about you know uh, uh, a, a grass model of growing a lawn, and it's, it's very interesting because sometimes we talk about this idea of work at the edges is letting wild grass grow at the edges, letting things happen that you you can't allow happen in the core of the organization. And very often that's where the variety starts to happen when when the wild grass grows at the edges. So I, I love that reference to a, a grass model of, of growing a, a, a lawn. And I, I must definitely uh, uh, look, look into that. Just one yeah, last, sorry. just I see a, a question there from uh, uh, whoever uh, analytics uh, wise DF360 is, <laughs> I guess that's not the Christian name. Um, it's an interesting point about defending the core and experimenting at the edges simultaneously. And it absolutely is a juggling act. And I'd be interested if, if, if we can unmute or whatever, Matt, uh, some of the folks there to see if there's any insights in that. I'd be interested to see if there's any research or books or anything out there because 
that's constantly, certainly in my professional experience, what you're constantly doing. You're, you're, you're paying credence to the need for the company to herd the cats, i.e. we need to have structure, we need to have control, otherwise, any, you know, humans start to stratify if they group in more than 40 or 50, okay? That's the whole science behind that one. So it's needed, but sometimes it overcorrects and it squeezes the, the, the innovation. So it is that constant balance, but I'd be very interested if anybody had any thoughts on research or thinking or models or frameworks around that balancing act, because in and of itself, it, it's a, a great, okay, digital matrix, digital matrix, matrix book, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, it's a uh, interesting topic. And, and actually, it's, it's a good question, Bart, because the one, the, the thing maybe, and I, uh, we need to stress as well, like, um, uh, effectual innovation isn't necessarily talking about getting rid of hierarchy at all because hierarchy is actually uh, good when you know exactly what it is needs to be done yeah. and how you need to do it and when Absolutely. you need to do it and who needs to do it so actually effectual innovation isn't saying you rip all that out actually effectual innovation yeah. is should coexist the very need for effectual innovation is the fact there is hierarchy um, and uh, what it is is about trying to uh, create uh, I suppose these um, changes that can be that can uh, move into the core of the organization and maybe uh, becomes part of the core of the organization but it's definitely not arguing that there should be no need for a hierarchy because hierarchy isn't yeah. bad per se bureaucracy isn't necessarily good you know but hierarchy isn't necessarily bad either yeah 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 completely agree completely agree there's another hour in that conversation alone Matt, there's a podcast yeah we'll 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 have to explore that one later i really appreciate the conversation i think now might be a, a good time to draw this conversation to a close and and let the attendees uh get their uh their break in. I want to appreciate uh, just say uh, that I'm so appreciative to be a part of this. And, and uh, I know John and Stephen had to go. Uh, Barry Potty, thanks so much for sharing this with us. And to all the attendees, thank you for joining us uh, with this conversation. And I, I know we're all interested in exploring this more. So uh, please use the strategic doing channels. Please use LinkedIn to follow up with us uh, because uh, we do want to keep this conversation going. Yeah. And just one point on that, Matt, it, it's to say special words, a word of thanks to the, um, the strategic doing conference organizers though, for making this space available to us today. Uh, and uh, also, I suppose, for uh, that hand of collaboration that's going on between strategic doing and effectual uh, innovation. Uh, and uh, special thanks to, uh, to Ed Morrison for, for making this happen as well today. So take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. See you, folks. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye.